Audiobook The World of the American Pit Bull Terrier by Richard Stratton Part 6 Meat bones are not customarily supplied to them. Their training differs from the Anglo-American method. It includes simulated combat between carefully muzzled dogs. This is considered more vigorous than walking in the park. Tosa dog competitions take experience into account, so weight is not the only consideration. These competitions involve oriental ceremonies that are carefully observed. They are not applicable in tournaments involving a Tosa and some other race. A tournament between two Tosas usually ends when one combatant decides he is losing. He then quickly leaves the arena. The winner does not chase him. The loser is considered under the same example as a boxer when his trainer throws in the towel. The boxer is identified as a loser, but he is not exiled from the country, and there is always the expectation that he can try again on another date. Before dismissing a Tosa dog ritual, it's worth noting that courage comes in many forms. There are individuals who will fight in a bar, with many opponents, but have no interest in fighting in a ring for money. There are bikers who will ride their Harley Davidson recklessly over a cliff but won't quit the job they hate. There are dogs that are afraid of men but not at all afraid of other dogs, and so on. In competitions between a TOSA and an APBT, the ceremonial rules do not apply. Arrangements are tailor-made. The most predictable element is a practical function of time. Most Tosa's wins come between 15 to 18 minutes. They tend to lose the competition if the time exceeds this duration. The History of the Dog Louis Lutz, LMU Professor of Biology Pit Bull Gazette, February 1982 it is difficult to make a positive statement about the origin of the domestic dog, Canis familiaris, family dog. Dogs have a unique basic structure but can change greatly in appearance. Under the hands of man, the domestic dog has moved far from its ancestor of earlier origin. There is convincing evidence from fossils that carnivores, meat eaters, of many widely different types arose with certain others from a common ancestor during the Paleocene era, see geological time graph. Modern carnivores are relatively difficult to characterize. Certain features, however, seem to remain the same, such as the number of incisors and well-developed canine teeth. The current missing branch of the different carnivores can be said to have started in the Oligocene period, see graph, but the line can be traced back through the carnivorous type canine or dogs of the late Eocene era, see graph, to the carnivorous type of the weasel in the Paleocene era, all the way back to the Credanto insectivore type which includes both meat-eating animals and insects than so many other animals originated. Until their extinction during the Paleocene, creodonts were the predominant carnivores. From the creodonts came what are known as the actoid carnivores, which were small animals primitive in structure with low skulls, small brains, and a complete set of teeth. The canine teeth, good for cutting close, were not yet developed. The limbs and body were long and slender with a long tail. The four limbs usually ended in five toes and they walked with the soles of their feet fully touching the ground. The first true physipeds, animals with feet apart, appeared in the Paleocene era, possibly from the Artoides carnivores. Physipeds expanded during the Oligocene era. In contrast to creodonts, weasels appeared to have a larger, more developed brain and true canine teeth that were located further forward in the head. These features are exactly typical of physipeds, and for this reason weasels are considered to be the most primitive physipeds. The small, meat-eating weasel lived in the forest, 
preying on small animals that lived in dense undergrowth or in trees. Weasels and their relatives were the direct ancestors of modern carnivores or meat-eaters. The ancient artoid carnivores were like their ancestors, weasels in that they were probably forest dwellers who hunted small game that they could catch in the woods and trees. Two carnivorous animals, Cynodictus, found in the Eocene era, and Hesperocene, found later in the Oligocene era, were among the earliest canines. Although they still had many characteristics of their weasel ancestors, they did show certain aspects that would characterize them as dogs or canines. They showed some length in their legs and feet and the canines were more like blades than they are in weasels. From the Hesperosian, various stages of canine development later took place. In the Miocene era, C. Graf, were the carnivorous Cynodictus, followed by Tamarctus, found in the Pliocene era, C. Graf, and finally to modern dogs like Canis from the Pleistocene, C. Graf, and recent times. This sequence represents the main line of dog evolution. Man and dog have lived together and worked together since the Neolithic era. The variety of modern dog species is proof of how they can change genetically and the explanation of how they differed in appearance from their canine ancestors. However, certain basic primitive structures remained unchanged. Geological periods covering the development of carnivores and other animals. How to breed, train, and obtain an APBT for the purpose of a guard dog and family defense, and other short stories. Max Coates. Pitbull Gazette, May 1980. Before getting started on how to train an APBT, let me first describe the type of situation my training method serves. Bear in mind that this method is not as good when compared to the work a trained professional will do if he takes your dog to be trained for you. This should, however, be good enough for most novices to do at home without damaging their dog or spending a fortune to have him trained. The situation that is most common for an owner of an APBT fighting breed is that the owner usually has a family and lives in a community, keeps the dog in his home and has an average number of visitors there. Fine person you described as a typical APBT owner to me, aren't you Mr. Humane Society? He needs a dog that will obey simple commands, be wonderful with the kids, know when it's right to fight and of course will stop an aggressor in his lane if need be. What he doesn't need is a dog that will litter the house with his needs, destroy the furniture, eat his neighbor's doberman, let him be released to relieve himself in his yard, or bite his daughter's boyfriend, even he deserves it. First of all, selection is important. Refer to my previous article on why you should insist on getting a fighting PBTA. You should visit anyone who has experience with fighting dogs that have been successful and were bred to be that way. Avoid kennels whose owners brag about how their dogs beat five German shepherds or six Akitas but never found a notable specimen other than their own breeding. Also avoid kennels whose fame about dogs is sustained by having good dogs for their grandparents. Spend time verifying that your prospective pup's parents did more than eat, sleep, and have sex. Now you can make a smart selection based on the following. When visiting a kennel, see how your puppy's parents react to you when you go to them with their owner. What I like to see a dog do is accept me and be friendly as it should be obvious to the dog that its owner has accepted me and a good dog should follow this process. Ask the owner if you can meet them yourself. A good dog should react by either barking or raising hell. Any reaction between these two will be acceptable. They shouldn't run into their doghouse and pray for help. It should be noted that some dogs are shy because of mistreatment or lack of socialization and they will not always pass this trait on to their offspring. 
Your puppy's parents should be impressive in appearance. By that I mean they must conform to ADBA, American Association of Dog Breeders, standards. The reason for this is simple. One of the biggest advantages to owning a dog is for a psychological deterrent to any potential troublemakers. If he comes across as tough then most people won't stand up to him. But if he looks like a cross between a mutt and a greyhound then the person might test him because he looks like a softy. As for the size, I really don't see any difference it makes to his power. The only advantage size has is deterring an attacker by its appearance. It seems that the bigger the dog is, the less the attacker attempts to attack him. Poppy, our lean and chiseled 40 kilo female could go through a man like a knife through butter, but then so could CH Roxy or CH Mama Sean and both females are only half that size. I guess this could be like a choice of getting shot by a 357 or 44 Magnum. One is bigger, but both will kill you. If you can find bigger dogs that are bred to fight and have the space to keep a big dog then I'll stick with one of those as long as he's less likely to prove his punch. But then again, I've never had an offer from any of the crazies I know to fight a few rounds with Roxy either. When selecting your puppy from a litter, take the boldest acting and most salient of the bunch. A simple test to do is to take a puppy that you like from the litter and place it in an unfamiliar place. If he walks around and still acts bold you've got a good pup there. For those who want a more detailed test, ATTS has a number of tests that can help you. Now that you've got your puppy, the most important thing to do is spend time with him and start training him to do his business outside, not to chew furniture, etc. Don't be afraid to talk to him a lot or take him everywhere you go. Those who know my female Katie understand how the attention she received as a little girl helped her in many situations. To educate him try the following ideas. Buy a large, airy kennel and line it with newspapers. This will leave him confined while you are away or unable to supervise him properly. Always let him outside when you go out, after eating, and as soon as you get home. Take some sheets of dirty newspaper and place them on top of the clean ones and leave them at the door and put some outside. When he's running wild and has to do his business he'll probably do it wherever his scent is. That is, of course, on the doorstep. When you see him or hear that he's at the door, let him out. Soon you will be able to take the newspaper from the door, as long as he is in the habit of going there to ask to leave. In the event of an accident on your carpet, clean it thoroughly with a urine neutralizer to eliminate any odors. If you follow these steps you have already accomplished a lot in training your puppy. For toys, I give a tough, hard rubber ball. Never give away old shoes, as most puppies cannot tell the difference between an old shoe and a new one. Now that he's educated his next step is to start obedience training. Buy a good book on obedience training or take your pup to an obedience class when he's 6 to 8 months old, if he's still sociable and not ready to fight. The class will most likely be sponsored by the local Humane Society, so a word of wisdom is not to tell them he is an APBT. Tell them he's a staff, or a mixed race. I know of some classes here in Virginia that don't allow APBT and even if they do will be subject to instructor bias. Besides, you might get in trouble with some of the simpletons, who would want to put a Siberian husky to fight with their pit bull while he gives them a lecture on how cruel dogfighting is. If his dog beats your dog in a fight, and you live in California, then get an order for your arrest with a dog fighting charge and also one for the Humane Society instructor, on a charge of promoting fighting.
Just think about how they will and you will be able to figure out a way to accuse you. But chances are, if you don't tell them he's an APBT, you won't have any problems. When you're spending time with your puppy, always use positive reinforcement for feats well done. Never call him out and then punish him, as he will link coming to you with the punishment. Always go to him and verbally scold him. If you've spent a lot of time with him, he'll know by the tone of his voice that he screwed up. Once your puppy knows his name, is well socialized, polite and obedience trained, you can now move on to the next phase. That is, conditioning him to be a guardian of you and your family without being a source of bad publicity or legal trouble. Getting started is relatively easy. When you hear someone at the door, say in a surprised voice, what's that pup, what's that? If the pup barks, give him plenty of praise, then put him in the back room and allow your visitor inside. Then bring back your pup and tell him, it's all right pup, and let the visitor pet him. Always do this and he will soon know that no one except family members can come and go through the door. And second, when you accept someone, he has to accept you too. The key again is his tone of voice. Never allow anyone to turn their back on him or tempt him to see if he bites. The only thing you can have is either a broken dog or a broken person. Repetition, consistency, and time spent with your puppy are keys to getting the most out of your puppy. If you plan on doing a reheated version of this method, then you will fail and are better off getting your pup out there on a chain, or better yet, not having one at all. My ideas may sound simple, but if you try you will find results that are more than satisfactory. If your drive drives you to do more, then put your energy into obedience training. Any agitation made by a novice or dog owner, this is a very bad idea, can turn your well-behaved fighting dog into the creature the Humane Society writes about in their propaganda-filled newsletters they send out to earn money. These ideas should allow a novice to have a dog that will be everything a man could ask for. After all, your dog is 100% a tried and true American pit bull terrier. The Nature of the Animal Richard F. Stratton Pit Bull Gazette, August 1981 A pit bull is a killing machine with a trigger that responds to the slightest pressure, and you never know what will make it fire. I watched with surprise as one person said these words, for the person who was speaking was not simply a humanist bent on exterminating the bulldog race. No, he was an experienced and respected breeder, and more than that, I understood that there was only a grain of truth in what he was saying, hardly any, of course, but enough to lend legitimacy to his comment. Later, I received at least a few complaints from some breeders who said that I overreacted in saying that they are gentle and trustworthy dogs with respect to their attitudes towards people. On the other hand, I have heard from Europeans that they are disappointed with the dogs they have imported, apparently because they were not aggressive towards humans. Those breeders in Europe and Asia and new breeders in this country may be interested in knowing the true nature of the breed. To really understand our race, it is necessary to understand that in all races there is a certain variation in temperament. Many people will be surprised to learn that a fair percentage of pit bulldogs are mildly shy, sometimes very shy, around people. And that includes dogfight winners, dogs that were real dynamos in the dogfight. Circe Jeff, Art, Tonka, and Peterbilt were examples of good fighting dogs that were somewhat shy. Now, some owners are embarrassed by such dogs, feeling that they reflect unfavorably on the breed. Even fighting dog breeders are inclined to favor salient dogs over timid ones. I, too, have apprehension about shyness, as I have this image of bulldogs with fierce and firm temperaments. 
I think this image is mostly correct. Nevertheless, I did a Peterbilt cross and I intend to do a Tonka one eventually. The quality of the dogs is too great to ignore, and fortunately, they don't seem to produce a preponderance of shy dogs. On the other side of the spectrum are bulldogs, the ancients called them screwballs and usually euthanized them, that will attack people. In such a dog, my friends, we really have a real dangerous animal. These dogs are not only perfectly capable of killing a man, but they can also have the nerve to eat him too. Some of these matadors are good fighting dogs, Bully Sun and Pit General would be examples of this. However, they are in the minority, being far outnumbered by the occasional timid dog in the ring. The ancients believed that man-biters were prognosticated as non-fighting or mutts. I don't believe it, but I do think a people-biter fighting dog is a rare commodity. I've never owned even one in all the years I've bred dogs. Among them, we have the typical bulldog, easygoing and kind to people but mean to other dogs. Most of them are very nervous around other dogs. At dog shows they can be seen absolutely unruly among themselves. However, their handlers are able to place their hands inside the mouths of these impetuous demons and lift their lips so that the judge can see what the tooth structure looks like without any fear of being bitten. Because the typical bulldog is a good guard dog, I always say that they are not natural guard dogs as they are always barking and suspicious of strangers. However, they can be trained to guard and are trained to attack in which case they invariably make other races look pitiful in comparison. To add. 1. There is a small percentage of bulldogs that will bite people. Some are aggressive and not likely to make a sustained attack. Others are not afraid of humans and, in fact, are extremely dangerous to them. Fortunately, Bulldogs in this category are extremely rare. Unfortunately, some newbies are inclined to ignore this feature or even build for it. To be honest, even I wouldn't have the heart to kill a dog of the quality of Bully Sun or Pit General, however, I am generally in favor of euthanizing pit bulls that dislike people. 2. An even higher percentage of bulldogs are shy of people, and sometimes, but not always, shy of noise as well, such as squeaks or gunshots. These dogs are normally fearless with other dogs and are often quarrelsome. Although these dogs are often very intelligent, it's hard not to develop a special rapport with them. However, there are two reasons to avoid this trait, except in the case of excellent individuals. One is for the sake of the dogs, as it must not be nice to be painfully shy. The other is that the trait doesn't fit the mystique of the pit bull. 3. So we are left with the vast majority of bulldogs who are completely friendly with people and pose no danger to them. Apple of Discord Richard F. Stratton Pit Bull Gazette, February 1982 like most of you, I read my gazette cover to cover, and I usually find articles interesting and provocative. Occasionally, a letter or article contains something I disagree with, but I usually don't care, as they are normally matters of little consequence, and after all, there is room for diversity of opinion. Indeed, such diversity stimulates thought and even study and research. However, in the latest issue of the Gazette, there were some items that either reflect very poorly on the breed or will mislead novices. For this reason, I'd like to take some time to talk about this particular bone of contention. First, Mr. Well David in the viewpoint section bemoans the breed's present popularity and blames it on the rumors. 
Well, I have to admit that I prefer the days when race was unknown and not the subject of continual sensationalist presentations through the electronic and print news media. I would never have written my two books on the APBT if the cat hadn't been out of the bag, so to speak. But it was inevitable that the pit bull would become popular in these turbulent times. Simply pick up any dog show magazine, and you will find that the breeds that are featured are the Rottweiler, Doberman, Great Dane, etc. People who own these dogs are really looking for a pit bull, but they never knew anything about them until recently. Mr. David makes the mistake of putting all the cats in the bag. While it is true that some sellers have been detrimental to the breed, so too have some breeders of fighting dogs. I really resent the characterization of Mr. David of John P. Colby, as he was an honest breeder and an asset to the breed. And Mr. David is far from principled when he concludes that those who put their reputations on the line to defend the APBT are doing so for their own benefit. Sandra Keller has never in her life sold a dog, and those who know me know that I don't normally sell dogs. But anyway, there are many breeders who sell dogs on a regular basis to the general public who are assets to the breed. I admit that I belong to the school which is inclined to regard the general race of dog sellers with suspicion, but I am not so stupid as to paint them all with a single brush or blame the publicity aimed at the actions of the humanists on them. Finally, any man would be a fool to try to make money from any breed of dog. Some have succeeded, but frankly speaking, it's a bad proposition. There is a lot of amateur competition, and dogs are like rabbits in that they breed so prolifically that they can fill any demand in a relatively short time. So let's not be quick to condemn the motives of others aimed at profit. In another letter, Mr. R.M. Ank made a case for the breeder's infusion of outside blood into the breed, utilizing Armitage's assessment of the first fight he had ever seen. In that fight, a half pit bull and half Boston Terrier defeated a pure pit bull. What did Mr. What Ank didn't say is that, according to Armitage, this same dog was thrown in the towel in his next fight over a pure pit bull. As I said before several times, there were undoubtedly other races crossed with other races, but they were very rare because the profound courage was always lost. Where does everyone think the word, mutt, came from? In any case, the APBT is pure and not weak, perhaps more so than any other breed of dog. Finally, I'd like to make a few comments about Vince Cooper's provocative idea article. I don't know Mr. Cooper, but his article shows him to be a very perceptive man. I will turn my nose up though at his article that most pit bulls are not brave, even though I know what he means. Truly, most pit bulls are not courageous enough to die, but I prefer to think in degrees of courage. If it were possible to test the mettle of all the races individually, we would theoretically end up with a nice bell-shaped bend for each race. There is no way of knowing for sure, of course, as there is no way of experiencing such a study, however, I think the average courage of other breeds is light years from that of the pit bull. Also, novices should be aware that the Doberman that Mr. Cooper wrote is one of those excellent exceptions to the rule. Dogs of other breeds that can beat the pit bull in its own fight are rare, and even these excellent exceptions usually go down quickly when competing with good dogs. While I agree with Mr. Cooper that courage does not equate to intelligence, however, I think there was a selection process for intelligence in the ring because, all else being equal, intelligence was a definite asset, 
I most certainly do not like the statement that dogs fighting skills range from intelligent to stupid in combat. It may not be rational, but it's not stupidity. A dog's instinct is not simply related to intelligence. Thus, it is not rational for a retriever to signal the game, for a retriever to become so obsessed with catching game, or for a bloodhound to track when given the signal, but it is not stupid either. It is simply a powerful instinct not linked to intelligence. To get the point across, let's consider the sexual attitude in humans. Now, is this rational? No, it gets us into all sorts of trouble. But intelligent men are not less affected than fools. A few fighting dogs are really little babies when being examined by the veterinarian, but as a breed, they have a courage that allows them to even cooperate in his treatment. More than any other race, they seem to realize that we humans are trying to help them. Most veterinarians are especially fond of pit bulls precisely because of this particularity and because they are usually not afraid of being bitten by their patient, if he is a pit bull. While most pit bulls are not naturally aggressive towards people and are not inclined to bark, they are psychologically intimidating to would-be intruders because of their imposing appearance. I have also observed that the pit bull that has been trained for Schutz hunt work without fail exceeds all competitions in the attack phase because of the intensity of his attack and the way he literally explodes at his opponent. The challenge here is to train the dog to abort the attack on command. Finally, some fighting dogs may not be interested in fighting other animals, but a sizable proportion may be, and believe me, they can be terrible, putting all other races to shame in that regard. Watching a good pit bull doing a good job on a bad bull or a wild boar is an unbelievable sight. I sincerely hope that Mr. Cooper don't be offended by my minutiae, as I enjoyed his article very much, and I wouldn't want to enjoy it. As Mr. Cooper, I can appreciate other races, too. But, also like Mr. Cooper, I have enough experience with other breeds that I cannot be satisfied with anything less than a fighting pit bull. This was the fifth part of the audiobook. The World of the American Pit Bull Terrier By Richard F. Stratton My name is Rodolfo Luis, and I invite everyone to enjoy the knowledge of this wonderful breed. Subscribe so you don't miss the next video. God bless you all. I went.